Hi class, this is Dr. Swanberg and we're going to talk about some of the course readings for English 102. Um, we are talking about the second set of poems which begin with, um, I believe, The Poor, um, which is a poem by William Carlos Williams. Um, this is a very short poem. Um, uh, and I'm not going to I'm not going to go over each poem in depth because I don't want to do your reading for you. But I'm going to tell you some things of note to think about as you are reading the poems. Now, as you read the poem "The Poor" by William Carlos Williams, um, it's important to note that William Carlos Williams was actually a physician. He was a doctor in the early 20th century. So when he writes about the school physician. Uh, he's thinking about his firsthand experiences working as a doctor in a rural community. And um, so uh, think about this as you think about him building his building trust with the children in the school that he's talking about here. So he is a doctor and that's important to think about when reading his poems. All right. Um, in thinking about Out Out, um, I would like to talk for a moment about this poem. This poem is difficult. It's raw. It's, it's painful. Um, there's a child who is working. He's doing a man's work and a saw uh, cuts off his hand and he bleeds to death in front of his family members. It's pretty dramatic. It's pretty traumatic. Um, and it's very vivid imagery here say, with the child speaking. Um, don't let him cut my hand off. The doctor, when he comes, don't let him, sister. Um, but so the hand was gone already. It's important to know that ether is a, um, an anesthetic used to put people to sleep for surgeries before we had drugs like sodium pentothal. Um, so um, the child passes. He dies here. Um, little less nothing, and that ended it. Um, and then it says, no more to build on there. And since they were not the one dead, turn to their affairs. Now, this seems very, very cold. It seems almost as monstrous as the machine itself that cut the boy's hand off. And we see it, the saw compared to a monster earlier in the poem. Um, but I think we're misunderstanding the poem if we stop there. Um, we've got to ask ourselves what the affairs of the living are when someone you love has died. You have to arrange a funeral. You have to um, dispose of the body and clean up the mess and pay the doctor um, and pay the funeral director. Um, and if you're running a farm, you have to milk the cows or and collect the eggs from the chickens and tend to the crops or your farm will die and your family will starve. Um, and doing all of that in the wake of a child's death will feel monstrous. I, I know um, from personal experience that when you've lost someone you love, there are days when the fact that you are not dead feels monstrous. Um, and going to work feels wrong. And getting up in the morning feels wrong um, when that loved one has died. Um, but notice it says, since they were not the one dead, this is the only reason they turn to their affairs. They're not turning to their affairs not caring. They're not dead, and they don't have any choice. Um, it's brutal, um, but it's not the people who are brutal. It's the situation that's brutal. Um, so read that um, carefully with a, with a sense of compassion for the loss of the people and, and don't mistake them for being cold. I think that's misreading the poem. Saturday's Child um, by County Cullen is based, um, well, it alludes to a little poem that they used to have that said things like Wednesday's Child is full of woe and stupid stuff like that. I was born on a Wednesday and they always told me that. I'm not full of woe. I'm pretty happy. Um, but this one is saying that Saturday's child, and it's playing on this, Saturday's child, I think, was all blessed and happy and wonderful uh, in that poem. But he's, he's turning that on its head and saying, I was born on Saturday, and his father said, bad time for planting a seed. So this is about um, a child knowing he was unwanted because he was a burden and times were tough for his father. Um, it's also important to notice this line 
um, it says, um, death cut the strings that gave me life. And here, um, it's possible, we don't entirely know what this means. Some people interpret it that his mother died in childbirth. Um, some people interpret it that he lost his parents, um, both of them, by death or disappearance. I think it's more likely that the mother died in childbirth, given that he, he talks about his father throughout, um, but doesn't say things that his mother said to him. Um, so that's my interpretation of that. I would be interested to hear your interpretation. Yours might be a little different than mine, and that's okay. All right, um, in talking about incident, I am going to open this, and you can pause this or fast forward it if you want to, um, and um, that's okay. Um, this is about, this is a poem by an African American poet, County Cullen again, who was a writer in the Harlem Renaissance, which was in the early part of the 20th century. Um, and it's about a trip he took to Baltimore um, when he was little. He was eight years old. That's the, that's the age of my daughter right now. Um, and he sees uh, another little kid. He sees another boy who was no bigger than him. And the little boy calls him a horrible name. Um, a painful, painful name. And then the last stanza talks about the effect of that insult. He said, I saw the whole of Baltimore from May until December. That's months. That's months he was in Baltimore. Sees a whole city. And he says, of all the things that happened there, that's all that I remember. This insult from this child is the only thing that stuck with him about months in Baltimore. And it, it really shows us the power of our words to hurt people um, and how careful we have to be with our words um, in order to not hurt and insult people. Um, and so it's a very, very powerful poem. Um, and um, I would look forward to any of you uh, writing about the impact of this poem um, or connections you may have had with it with people using insulting language in your own experience. Okay, uh, One Art uh, is a poem by Elizabeth Bishop. Elizabeth Bishop was an American poet who wrote in the 40s and 50s and 60s. Um, she left her hometown of Nova Scotia, uh, hometown, home state, home city of Nova Scotia, uh, which is uh, in the Northeast, of the United States and Canada, um, and she left for Brazil, and she ended her life living in Brazil. And she has lost her partner. She has lost the love of her life in this poem. Um, and she starts by saying, the art of losing isn't, too, isn't hard to master. And she talks about practicing losing things, losing your keys, losing an hour here or there, um, losing farther and faster places, names, where it was you meant to travel, losing her mother's watch, which you can imagine probably hurt a bit when you lose something precious. Um, houses are gone, um, cities she's moved out of, um, rivers, continents. So when she says she's lost continents, she has. She's moved from North America to South America. Um, and she says, I miss them, but it wasn't a disaster. And then she tries in this last stanza to talk about losing her loved one. And it's so painful, she can barely make herself do it. This little piece in parentheses is, is just so filled with emotion. You can almost hear her choking up as she thinks it, <laughs> um, making herself write this, because it does feel like and look like a disaster. There's so much emotion here. It's very understated. That means we say less than it means. It would be like us saying 2020 has been a little difficult. Um, but um, here there's understatement going on. There's, there's much less said here than we feel. And we can feel it if we pay attention to the words. Read it out loud and see what those parentheses do. Um, they, they make you choke up a little, and that's really amazing that a poem can do that. Read this one out loud. It'd be good for you. Okay. Um, Riot. Oh, my goodness. This is a very difficult poem. And Riot and Harlem really should be read together. As a matter of fact, I'm going to open Harlem first. Okay. Harlem is a poem by Langston Hughes, also a writer in the Harlem Renaissance, an African-American author who 
was one of the first black men admitted to Columbia College in Columbia uh, in New York City, um, which is my alma mater. Um, and uh, he writes, what happens to a dream deferred? Now here, I, I, we believe he's talking about the dream, the same dream that Martin Luther King Jr. talked about, that dream of equality, that dream of equal access under the law, of equal treatment, of, of equal respect. And it's been deferred. Deferred means to be put off. And he says, what happens to a dream deferred? Does it dry up like a raisin in the sun or fester like a sore and then run? Does it stink like rotten meat or crust and sugar over like a syrupy sweet? Maybe it just sags like a heavy load. Or does it explode? Um, and I think we see in history that there are times when the dream of a people for equality has been deferred so long that it explodes. We see that in the French Revolution. We see that over and over again in the riots um, in our own country. Um, and then we see it here in Riot. Now, Riot is written by Gwendolyn Brooks, another African-American poet. Um, and she is responding specifically to Martin Luther King, who wrote, a riot is the language of the unheard. And these unheard, these are the people for whom that dream has been deferred too long. Um, and she's talking about John Cabot, who's a white man, and she spends some time describing John Cabot and all of his fancy rich man things, his scotch, his jaguar, his fancy place to live. Um, his um, fancy French restaurants that he, that he dines at. Um, and she's painting a picture there of this white man. And facing him are the people coming down the street. Um, and then she describes, really from John Cabot's perspective, um, the people he sees coming down the street. Um, and they are black and loud. And I love that line because... Um, it goes, it sounds so much like black and proud, um, but it's so uncontained um, and untamed. Um, they were black and loud and not detainable and not discreet. And we've got to remember here that at the time she's writing, black people were coerced into being discreet all the time. And if they quote unquote stepped out of line, they were treated very badly. They could be beaten. Uh, Emmett Till was a young man who was not discreet, and he was beaten to death for it. Um, so think about the history in these lines where they are not detainable, they're not discreet, um, they're angry, they're, they're loud, um, and they're coming. Um, and then he has this response to them. He's freaking out. He's terrified. Um, and they say to him, Cabot, John, you're a desperate man and the desperate die expensively today. And he does die. And these are his last words. And I'd like you to really think and grapple with the awfulness of his last words. Um, they are a, a perversion of something Christ said on purpose. Right, Christ on the cross said, um, forgive them, they know not what they do, um, of the people who were crucifying him. And here we have this rich white man um, who's terrified and losing his life saying a paraphrase of that, but using, again, perverting it with this awful, insulting word in there to make it so problematic and so uncomfortable and so wrong. Um, so this is a very difficult poem to grapple with. It is hard even to read and understand, but it's really worth it. It really pays off. There's so much strength here and so much anger. Gwendolyn Brooks, a lot of her poems are very sedate and very, as I say, discreet and polite. And this is so all out and so um, strong and scary. And I think it's important to read scary literature about scary times in history because if we if we don't, um, then we run the risk of forgetting how dangerous and scary the times were. Um, all right, uh, so looking back at the poems, Elegy, Elegy to Jane is a very different kind of poem than, than the previous ones. This is by Theodore Rethke, who was um, a poetry professor 
And this is about a student of his who died and he's grappling with how much he loved her and will miss her and yet what's appropriate for a professor. He's stuck in that role. He, he ends it with I with no rights in this matter, neither lover, father nor lover. Um, and yet he's, he's going to miss her terribly. Read it with um, a real human in mind. Um, I know I have lost students of mine. I've, I've learned of their deaths. I, I visited a former student of mine on his deathbed in the hospital. And it, it was brutally hard and awkward. I didn't know what to say to his parents. I don't know what to say at the funerals, but I, I go and I'm there and it's awkward and I'm, I'm wrecked by it. Um, one comes to know and love their students and feels their deaths keenly and, and, and read, that, read that with that understanding there. It's a beautiful poem. Um, and then Diving into the Wreck um, is our last one. And this is by Adrian Rich. Um, and Adrian Rich um, was uh, a poet who wrote, uh, she wrote, she wrote in the second part of the 20th century. Um, and she's talking about um, loss and she's talking about um, the wreck of really her own body to breast cancer. She was a breast cancer survivor. Um, and a lot of this poem thinks about the wreck of one's own body. Um, it's also thinking about the wreck from um, a hurricane, uh, a wreck uh, of a ship. Um, but they um, we're thinking about all, don't just think about the wreck as something literal here. Think about maybe the, the possible larger meanings of a wreck um, and think about, um, think about the body and think about the wreck of a body as well um, and the wreck of a relationship or the wreck of, you know, some of these other things that a wreck might represent when you're reading this. Um, I hope that helps you walk through these other poems. Um, again, I haven't read through them entirely for you. I'd like you to do some of your own thinking. And of course, if you have a different interpretation to mine, um, I'd love to read about it.